fruit is shattered to scorn. In a land so often cursed by violence, mayhem in Beverly Hills. It's hard to find a place that has not been affected by Hurricane Lauren. Said to be the most powerful blast. Everywhere you look, there is damage. The U.S. lost more than 20 million jobs just in the month of Three April. Three years of back-to-back -back fires have taken a devastating toll. Coronavirus. 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 That's the mark of the beast. Well, hey, I'm Parker. I'm a pastor here at Ventura Missionary Church, and today we are going to be talking about suffering. You probably rolled out of bed this morning so excited for a pastor to talk to you about suffering. Hey, we're going to look at suffering from kind of three different lenses this morning, from the book of Revelation, which will lead us into the cross that Jesus died on, and then finally we'll end with a hero of mine named Michael Sattler. Before we get going, I need to give you guys kind of a parental warning type thing. Parents, if you have young children in the room during this talk, I just want to warn you that at times this talk will get graphic. I have two kids, ages five and two, and they will not be watching their dad preach this Sunday. Maybe a helpful kind of barometer if you're like, oh my gosh, what does that mean? Um, maybe this is helpful. Look, if you have shown your kids Ridley Scott's 2000 blockbuster hit film Gladiator, then they'll do fine in this talk. If you wouldn't show your kids that movie, I would not have them listen to this morning's talk. We have great content for your children, though, that you can access by going to VenturaMissionary.com, scrolling down just a little bit, and clicking on Kids Programming. So, let's read our text for the week. If you've got a Bible, open it up to Revelation chapter 12, verse 11. It says this, They overcame by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. They did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death. This is the word of the Lord. Revelation is written to, into a time in church history where it was very likely that if you were a follower of Jesus, you would experience great suffering. Doug did an awesome job a few weeks back setting the historical context for this book, so I'll just kind of refresh our memories. At the time, the emperor Domitian uh, was requiring all people to worship him as Lord. They were required to proclaim Caesar is Lord, Domitian is Lord. And for Christians, that posed something of a problem because we proclaim that Jesus is Lord, which has a double meaning and certainly did back in this context. Because when you say Jesus is Lord, it means simultaneously that Caesar is not Lord. And this caused Christians to be persecuted. Or another way to say that is just be treated absolutely horribly. There are stories of Christians getting stitched into animal carcasses, then fed alive to wild beasts. Tales of Christians being hung on poles and set on fire to light the emperor's dinner parties. People got stoned, and not the way your dad did at the Grateful Dead show, no. They had literal stones thrown at them until they died. Those were just a few of the ways that followers of Jesus were being treated when Jesus shows up and tells John to write down what he sees, what we now call the book of Revelation. What we see looking at church history is that suffering is the historical context of the book of Revelation. So let's get into our text for the week. We're going to focus in on one verse in particular, the verse that we just read, verse 11. This verse is specifically talking about followers of Jesus who are martyrs. That means that they've been killed for their allegiance to Jesus. And it starts out by saying that they, martyrs, overcame. This word overcame is nekao in Greek. If you're at home, can you say that with me? Nekao. Maybe you're driving to work alone and say that word with me. Nekao. If, if you're thinking and going, man, that sounds actually pretty familiar. It sounds like maybe the name of a company, you'd be absolutely right. It's where the company Nike got its name from, and it means victory. But this is such a weird word to use for what John is describing. Remember, this verse is talking about people who were stitched into lions and fed to beasts. It's saying that these people who died for their faith in Jesus are victorious, that they have overcome, that they have conquered, maybe your Bible says. And to me, this word choice, this is just wild. See, it's saying that a bunch of people who were martyred are called victorious. If you think about war, the people who lose their lives in battle, they're not called the victors. So what does this mean? What is this verse saying? How did these people win their victory? 
The rest of the verse tells us. Verse 11 says, they overcame, remember this word, nekao, by the blood of the lamb. This means Jesus' victory on the cross. We're going to talk about that in just a few minutes. So kind of put a pause in your memory on this line. We'll come back to the cross in just a moment. Verse 11 continues, and the word of their testimony. Paul writes in Romans 10, 9, that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, remember that phrase, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. See, I talk to a lot of people, and so many of us think that that is a one-time act, and it's not. This is not a pray a prayer and then go on to live however you want kind of a thing to say that Jesus is Lord. Saying Jesus is Lord means that Jesus is your master. He's the ruler of your life and of the cosmos. It's to say that Caesar Domitian is not Lord, but it is also to say that you, I, am not the Lord of my life any longer. To say that Jesus is Lord is also to live like he is Lord. Confessing Jesus with our mouth happens every day in a billion different ways. It represents a willingness to continually hold on to the proclamation that nothing but Jesus is Lord. Not the Caesars of their day, not the Caesars of our day, and certainly not myself. See, this point is really important to grasp. We spend so much of our lives as followers of Jesus wrestling with Jesus over who is Lord. Is Jesus the Lord of your life, or are you the Lord of your life? I have to ask myself this question all the time. It's so easy for me to remove myself as Jesus, uh, excuse me, to remove Jesus as Lord in my life and then to put myself on his throne. I do this in a thousand small ways each day. Sometimes it's when I wait for someone else to take out the trash instead of serving them and doing it myself. It's when I don't look at my barista in the eyes because I'm just in too much of a hurry. So instead of treating like them a human being made in God's image, I just choose to see them as a thing instead. It's when I don't take the time to truly listen to someone. And instead, I just wait to kind of like have my word and get my word in to respond back to them. It's when I go from home to work to ramped up little kids and I just need a little me time, so I slip into the bathroom for five minutes just to breathe. I could go on and on and on. There are a million ways to dethrone Jesus in our lives each day. Each of us has our own things that hop on Jesus' throne in your life. And we have to identify those tendencies and we have to guard against them. We need to use our lives to testify to the reality that Jesus is Lord like the martyrs did in Revelation. Verse 11 continues into my favorite line. It says, they did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death. Jesus puts it this way in Luke 9, 23 and 24. He said, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for my sake will save it. Then is anybody else like intimidated by these verses? I have to daily pick up my cross in order to follow Jesus, a cross that is specifically built for me, cut for me, measures perfectly to my arms and my legs and my weight, a cross that is perfectly tailored for me. I have to be willing to pick that up every single day in order to follow Jesus. These are intimidating words. Now let's talk about the cross for a bit to get the weight of what Jesus is saying. The cross was seen as the worst way to die in Jesus' day, and it's primarily because of the amount of physical suffering it would cause. Often, uh, maybe you've heard people refer to the cross as the passion of Christ. Passion, in Latin, is the word paseo, and it actually more accurately translates to the word suffering. So put more accurately, the cross is the suffering of the Christ. We see that Jesus willingly goes to the cross, embraces the suffering, and dies. And you have to ask, why does he do this? For you and for me, right? This is central to the heart of the message of Jesus. The cross was Jesus bearing the full weight of my sin and your sin, simultaneously paying the price to buy us back and restoring our relationship with God. And to the OG Christians reading Revelation, the cross would have just been this mixed symbol now of horror and hope. They would have seen crucifixions before, 
having walked past the bodies hanging on the trees outside of their towns, shuddering by the horror of it, trying to hide their children's eyes. But now that they've come to faith in Jesus, something's shifted. See, now they would see the horror of someone hanging on a cross, but now they couldn't help but remember Jesus' own crucifixion and be filled with this strange hope. Hope alongside the horror of suffering. It, it honestly never ceases to amaze me that the cross, which is a torture tool, is now widely recognized as the most hopeful symbol in all of humanity. Why is that? I like what St. Theodore, the Studite, had to say about the cross. He says, what an astonishing transformation that death should become life, that decay should become immortality, that shame should become glory. Do you see the dramatic reversal here, what the cross does? The cross is not where death overtook Jesus, but rather it's where Jesus overtook death. It is horrific. But it reminds us that God brings hope from humanity's horror. The cross and the suffering of Jesus reminded the early Christians, and it reminds us today, that even when it looks like evil is winning, Christ has already won. Nikao. But we're also reminded that things like the cross are part of loving God. If you want to follow Jesus, you have to go through the cross daily. We can't escape the cross. So I want to ask you to take some time and think about this as I talk through the rest of this sermon. What's your daily cross? What's the thing that you have to pick up and carry? That one thing that causes you suffering in your life that you would rather just put down. Maybe it's suffering with a big S, meaning the horrible things like job loss, or maybe a miscarriage or multiple miscarriages. Maybe it's the death of a loved one, especially during COVID, and you couldn't be by their side as they died. Maybe you have an illness like cancer. Maybe you've had sudden financial loss because of this season. Maybe you've gone through a divorce. These are the, the big time sufferings, what I call suffering with a big S. Then there are also what I call little S sufferings. These are the things that we face every day that are hard, but nothing in comparison to what I just talked about. These are the, the failing grades that we get. It's an argument with a family member. That's the red light that you always catch, no matter how late you are. This is when you're not promoted at work, or maybe a rude client or a customer, an ungrateful boss, kids that wake you up at 3 a.m. every single night. Does that stop, by the way? <laughs> how do you respond to your suffering? Do you shrink from whatever it is that's causing you pain? I make a conscientious effort each time my son wakes me up in the middle of the night to under my breath say, thank you, Jesus. Because I know that this won't last forever. And instead of being resentful, straining for the days when I just sleep through one night, I choose to reframe my current perspective from one of a, a small S suffering to a perspective of gratitude. I choose to say in my head, thank you, Jesus, because I have a son, and I'm grateful for his life, even at 3 a.m. But if I'm being honest, there are moments when I just want to sleep when he comes in my room. Parents, you know this. There are moments when I just lay quietly for just one minute as he stands at my bedside, hoping my son is like the T-Rex from the original Jurassic Park movie, and he won't notice me if I don't move. It's really easy to want to escape from moments in our life. How do you escape? Do you try and escape with things like alcohol? Maybe you binge watch Netflix or constantly have news on in the background of your house. How about food? We've all eaten more sourdough bread during COVID than I even thought possible in one lifetime. Maybe you spend extra hours at work because you don't want to get home to your wife and kids. Maybe you have endless time scrolling on Instagram or Pinterest, just kind of numbing out and zoning out. How do you deal with suffering. Revelation chapter 12 verse 11 tells us that the early church didn't shrink from their suffering. And today they challenge us not to shrink from ours. The beauty of the cross and the victory of the martyrs is that we don't have to fear whatever suffering may come our way as followers of Jesus because we know that Jesus has won the ultimate victory for us. Nekao. When we love our lives, 
we have this tendency to shrink from whatever suffering comes our way. And we won't be willing to endure suffering. But when we're willing to place the love of our lives aside and daily take up our cross to follow Jesus, we will find life even in the midst of suffering because the cross of Jesus shows us that God can bring hope into horror. That, that's what this verse in Revelation 12 is showing us. That the martyrs, the women and the men who didn't love their lives so much as to shrink from death will have hope brought into their horrors. It's just like the cross of Jesus. Their own suffering and death is not without hope. Like Jesus, their cross will be their victory. You know, the rest of the world looks onto the cross and they think that it is horrific. And Christians, we see the horror, but we also see the hope in it. This is true for our individual lives. We see the horror of suffering, but we see it through rose-colored shades or cross-colored glasses. We see the hope in the midst of suffering. Women and men for nearly 2,000 years have suffered for following Jesus. Some have loved their lives and shrunk from death. Others have followed Revelation 12, 11, even unto death. A hero of mine, a man named Michael Sattler, was one of those people who didn't love his life so much that he shrunk from death. Michael was a follower of Jesus right around the time of the, when the printing press came out, which, if you know your history, was one of the bloodiest times ever to be a Christian. Michael was a priest-turned-pastor who became a martyr in Germany on May 21st, 1527. His death sentence was actually really common at the time. This is what it was. It's pretty bad. So his death sentence read like this. Searing hot tongues would rip off parts of your flesh. Then your tongue would be cut out. And finally, you would be taken to the center of town and burnt alive until you were ash. In fact, it was so common that this would happen to you that Michael's friends all wondered, man, is this victory that we read about in Revelation 12, 11 really worth it? Victory, nikao, is hard won. When you're in the middle of a fight, you can have times when you just want to give up, where you're going to ask yourself if nikao is worth it or not. Should you love your life and turn away from Jesus, or will you lose your life for his sake and taste nikao, taste victory? Is victory really worth taking up my cross every single day? Is victory worth the big S suffering? Is victory worth the small S suffering? Is hospitality worth it? Is your honesty worth it? Your integrity as a follower of Jesus, is it worth it? Is staying in my marriage really worth it? Not cheating on this test, is it really worth it? Talking to the odd neighbor because Jesus has commanded me to, is this really worth it? Is moving to Ireland to tell people about Jesus really worth it? Shout out to Austin White. Each day, we have the opportunity to pick up a thousand different crosses, to die a thousand different deaths, or shrink from those things. Each day, we ask ourselves internally the question, is victory really worth it? Michael's friends wondered, is all the pain and all of the suffering that he just endured worth this Revelation chapter 12, verse 11 type of victory? And can I go through the suffering too? Was the tearing off of his flesh with hot tongues worth the victory? Was the cutting off of his tongue worth the victory? Was the fire that was set on him worth the victory? That's what his friends wanted to know. They might have to endure the same thing after all. We're all a little bit like Michael's friends at some level. We want to know if the suffering that'll come from following Jesus really is worth victory. Michael's friends, they put together this brilliant plan with him. If victory was not worth it, right before he died, he would raise up one finger. If the suffering was too horrible to bear, and they, his friends, should turn away and no longer strive for victory, Michael would raise up one finger to tell them so. But if they could endure the suffering, if it was worth it, he would raise up two fingers to them telling them to press on to victory, press on to nikao. Could you imagine being Michael's friends, looking on at him suffering this horrific death, waiting in anticipation to see how many fingers would he hold up? 
We, like Michael's friends, we look on at those enduring suffering for Jesus, watching them, studying them, driven by this question that maybe we don't even have words for, is victory really worth it? Any parent will tell you that your kids watch everything you do. Truly, more is caught than taught. But our kids aren't the only ones watching how we respond to the suffering, big and small S suffering, that comes our way in the world. Our friends watch us. Our neighbors watch the way that you fight in your home as a follower of Jesus. Your coworkers watch the way that you handle business. Your cousins watch you. Your parents watch you. All of them wondering, is it really worth it? Is victory worth it? Will you raise one finger? Signifying victory is not worth it. Telling us to shrink from death, to escape the suffering, to run, to numb out, just hit the bottle, scroll endlessly through social media, watch nonstop television, do whatever it takes to escape the pain of following Jesus. Will you lift one finger, signifying that no, victory is not worth it? Or will you lift two fingers? Will you endure the suffering required from following Jesus, even unto death? Will you lift two fingers, telling us that victory truly is worth it? Man, keep going. See, this is what Michael's friends were all wondering as they watched him endure this horrific suffering. They watched for his hands as his whole body was consumed by fire, wondering what he would teach them about suffering and victory in his final moments. Is it worth it or not? And then, as his ropes that tied his hands together slowly burned off, as his flesh turned from white to black and charred, Michael bursts from his ropes and he raises up a hand holding two burning, charred fingers as he drops to his knees and dies. And those two fingers weren't just to his friends, but to us as well. This gesture, those two fingers silently screamed, Nekao, victory! And Revelation does the same thing. We see people who suffered, some underneath the category of little s suffering, and others underneath the category of big s suffering, holding up two fingers. See, Revelation tells us that no matter how much you have to suffer to faithfully follow Jesus, victory is worth it. And now it's up to us to believe it and act on that belief. Will you live a life that holds up two fingers to the world around you? A life that shows victory to the world, to your kids, to your grandkids, to your neighbors, your doctors, your parents, your coworkers? Or will you love your life and shrink from the victory that Jesus is leading you into? As you go back into your week, remember that the victory is worth it. Live a life that holds up two fingers to the world around you. Here's the deal, though. We need to be reminded of this, like, a lot. So remind one another this week. When you see your spouse struggling with homeschooling the kids, raise up two fingers to them and remind them that the struggle, the victory, it's worth it. Hold up two fingers to your Bible study group when you notice they're getting low. Hold up two fingers to your friend with cancer. My sister, it's worth it. To your church friend that you run into at the grocery store with their kids and you can tell that they're frazzled, remind them that the joy of following Jesus into parenting is worth it. Do it to me next week at one of our in-person services. I'm going to have moments this week where I go back to wondering, is victory really worth it? Please use your life like Michael Sattler in Revelation 12, 11, to hold up two fingers, reminding us all that yes, following Jesus truly is victorious. Let's pray. Jesus, we thank you for your victory on the cross. Thank you, Jesus, that now we get to just live out of that response, God. Help us to live lives that hold up two fingers to the world around us, that show the world that yes, even in suffering, whatever it costs to follow you, Jesus, is worth it. Give us the strength to pick up our crosses. And God, when we can't carry them, send men and women into our lives to help us with them. Jesus, we love you. We lean into you. We need you this week. Come, Holy Spirit, fill us. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen.